Okay, it seems we're live. So uh, I suggest I start. Um, hello, everyone. I, I trust you're doing well. Um, uh, it's a great pleasure to finally be here with all of you today. Um, and it would seem that almost everyone could make it um, from what I've seen so far. Uh, please allow me to warmly and kindly welcome you to the first session of the online Ouroboros seminar, uh, Life and Work of Francisco Varela, um, a seri series which is organized by the research group slash institute in the making, Metanoia, and the organization many of you probably know very well, namely Mind and Life Europe. Um, at this point, I would like to thank you all for joining us today, um, either via Zoom or via YouTube. Uh, and I would like to thank all the presenters and co-organizers for having enabled this event in, uh, to take place. Now, uh, before we get to the more juicy part, uh, please allow me to bore you just a little. Uh, as is normally the case, I will start with some uh, formalities and technicalities, um, but I'll do my best to keep this, these to the minimum so that we may get to the more interesting part of today's session as soon as possible. Um, so uh, just very briefly, um, as I will um, say more about the whole Ouroboros series in a separate video, which will be uploaded to both the uh, Mind and Life and uh, Metanoia uh, YouTube sites. Um, I will skip this particular part, um, but I would like to say a few words about um, the main aim uh, of this particular series uh, and the, 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 the main aim, the main goal of this uh, series is to create a platform um, for an in-depth study um, and discussion of Francisco Varela's multifaceted work. Um, as you all know, Francisco was a brilliant and, and diverse thinker uh, whose interests uh, uh, spanned several disciplines from philosophy through uh, um, uh, computer science, biology, and uh, uh, neuroscience. Um, and while some of his ideas, um, for example, notions such as an action and uh, autopoiesis have become somewhat mainstream, uh, there are still many topics and ideas um, that he was working on, uh, but were um, either forgotten or overlooked. The goal of these meetings, of these reading, readings, presentations, um, and discussions um, is to unearth these uh, less well-known ideas, to study them, relate them to the more well-known ones, and spell out their philosophical and scientific implications. Um, I would like to also point out at this point that um, this series is actually part of a larger series currently organized by Mind and Life Europe, uh, a series which is centered around two anniversaries, namely the 20th anniversary of Francisco's passing in 2001 um, and the 30th anniversary of the publication of Embodied Mind. So uh, one might say that this is indeed a very timely event. Um, also, I would like at this point to ask Gabor Karshai, uh, Managing Director of Mind and Life, if he would be willing to say a few words about this particular event, this event that is related to the two anniversaries. Thank you, Sebastian. And I also welcome everyone in the discussion group here in Zoom and also those who are following us live on the YouTube channel of Mind and Life Europe. It's a real privilege for us to co-organize the first Uroboros seminars with Sebastian Verus, uh, entitled The Life and Work of Francisco Varela. Uh, Francisco, as you may know, was one of the founders of Mind and Life, uh, co-created uh, with the Dalai Lama. And we at uh, Mind and Life Europe are dedicating this year's programs to honor Francisco's legacy. Uh, as Sebastian mentioned, this year is the 20th anniversary of his passing and the 30th anniversary of the Embodied Mind book that he co-authored with Evan Thompson, who is present here today, and uh, Eleanor Roche. 
we organized uh, the various events of this anniversary year around the title Embodiment and an Action, Varela and Friends uh, 2030, highlighting two of the many key terms in Francisco's and his collaborators' work, Embodiment and an Action. Of course, we will discuss these terms more extensively during the year, even in, even in this seminar series. And as part of the overall program of the year, we are going to co-organize conferences and uh, uh, other events with other partners commemorating the anniversaries, uh, such as working together with the Upaya Institute on the International Varela Symposium in May. And today we start with the first Uroboros session with Sebastian Verus and uh, Louis Kaufmann. Those who follow us live on YouTube, please feel free to share your questions in the chat stream. Uh, some of them may get selected and discussed in the live discussion group uh, later during the program tonight. Enjoy the discussions. Okay, thank you very much, Gabor. Um, a few brief words on the overall structure of the seminars. So there will be 14 meetings in total, uh, and in each uh, session, a different person, many of them Francisco's former colleagues, students, and or friends, uh, will present one or two pre-prescribed Francisco's papers in 20 to 40 minutes, approximately. Um, after that, we'll have a 60 to 90 minute discussion. Um, I will be coordinating, coordinating discussion. Um, um, so I would uh, kindly ask you to forward all the potential questions that may arise during the presentation uh, to me. You can simply send them via chat. So you find my name and you send me the question. Um, and uh, if for some reason you would like me to read the question, this is sometimes the case in, in these particular settings, please say so in the parentheses. But we would, of course, uh, much rather see that you yourself pose the question, if possible. As Gabor also mentioned, um, it is also possible to uh, post questions um, uh, at YouTube. So uh, feel free to do so. Um, and uh, also, uh, what is also important is please try to make your questions um, clear, cogent, and to the point, or at least as much as possible. I know this is sometimes a bit difficult, especially if the subject matter is um, uh, a bit difficult to, to, uh, uh, to grasp, to get into. Okay, so uh, now we can move on to the today's topic, today's theme. Um, now, um, as you might have noticed, um, after having read or having uh, attempted to read <laughs> the pre-prescribed papers for today, we are starting at the deep end. Uh, I would say that Francisco's work on the calculus of self-reference is probably one of the most difficult and for most people, the least accessible area of study uh, that he has um, um, been active in, uh, which, is I, which is why I personally, as someone who has tried on several occasions to kind of penetrate into this difficult topic, unsuccessfully, I might add, uh, I'm especially glad for today's session. Um, our presenter today is Louis Kaufmann, Dr. Louis Kaufmann. Uh, Louis Kaufmann has a PhD in mathematics from Princeton University. He taught at the University uh, of Illinois, Chicago, uh, uh, with visiting appointments abroad. His research deals with algeb algebraic topology, particularly low dimensional topology and its relationships with uh, algorithms, logics, combinatorics, mathematical physics, natural science, and formal diagrammatic systems. His research in virtual knot theory has resulted in the discovery of many new invariants of knots and links. In addition to editing journals and review volumes, he has written books on knot theory and map coloring. Lou will be presenting two papers today, namely Calculus of self Calculus of Self-Reference and the Arithmetic of Closure. Lou, it is an honor to have you here today. Um, now, before we go into the presentation, if you don't mind, I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, not only me, but other peoples would also uh, 
I'd be very happy to hear a few words on how you got to know Francisco and what was uh, your relationship like. Uh, so your collaboration with Francisco, if you could maybe say a few words on that before we get directly into the today's presentation. Oh, certainly. Um, uh, in the middle 70s uh, in Chicago, we had a seminar that was reading Spencer Brown's Laws of Form, uh, which you may know about and is a part of the background for some of the things I'm going to talk about. The Spencer Brown's uh, the, a book on Laws of Form is about distinction. And, and we, uh, at some point, started playing with self-referential formalisms related to Laws of Form. And we got into contact with Heinz von Forster, who encouraged us uh, very humorously in relation to that. And, and we also saw the papers by Francisco that were published in the Whole Earth Catalog, or no, a Whole Earth Journal, um, the not one, not two paper, and maybe some others, and the paper about calculus and self-reference. So um, I was very interested to speak with him because we were thinking on lines very similar to that. And, and so I got in contact with him. And um, and we began corresponding about self-referential structures. And eventually, I visited him at the Naropa Institute, uh, and we wrote a paper together called Laws called Form Dynamics. And uh, we continued this cordial interrelationship for quite some time. I visited the Naropa Institute a couple of summers, and and. Um, and we had a seminar there and we gave courses. Um, and I continued to visit him over many years after that. Marvelous, thank you very much. Uh, now, if you agree, uh, I would recommend, I would suggest that we go to the presentation at this point. Um, and as already said, after the presentation, we'll have a discussion on, uh, on the topic. Mm hmm. So I'll share a screen here. And in the meantime, hello again to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me see here. That's not what I want. That's what I want. So, so let's begin by uh, just highlighting uh, uh, these papers that we're going to look at. And I won't be going through the details of the papers, of course. But I will be going through some, their main ideas and um, and then hopefully giving you some uh, ideas that will guide you if you wish to look at them in, in more technical detail. But here is the paper, The Arithmetic of Closure uh, of Varela and Gogolin. And, um, and as you see, um, it begins with something called the closure thesis. And let me read a little bit. What's the proper notion of a whole? A major motivation for thinking in systems terms stems from the need to deal with the coherence and interconnectedness with which whole units present us in every domain. It is a suspected universality irrespective of the particularities of parts and specific processes that lends its fascination to a general theory of such systems. And they propose a closure thesis that every system whole is operationally closed. In other words, the, the very act of having uh, a whole means that there must be some invariant, some way of recognizing it because it keeps coming back in some form structurally. And those operations are where? Whose operations are those? Now you have to ask the question. Is it the system's operations? Is it your operations? Is it the observer's operations? And so on. Um, but they uh, boldly state that thesis. And then in the paper, they um, start unpacking that. And it's worth our while to listen to their language a little bit uh, about that. So I'll read a little more. Distinction and stability. Behind the simplest idea of a system stands the basic act of splitting the world in what we consider separable and significant entities. 
This is echoing, and I'm quite sure for them echoing, the statement of Spencer Brown in near the beginning of Laws of Form that says, a universe comes into being through uh, an act of distinction, through a separation. To be sure, there are many ways to perform this subdivision of our experience, but some criterion of distinction is always present. Given some criterion, we distinguish and recognize things such as animals, galaxies, families, systems, wholes appear to be quite universally distinguished. Persons, nations seem more variable. Every culture will select quite specifically which are the predominant criteria of distinction. This selection need not concern us now. What we're considering is the common properties of system holes under any criteria of distinction. So beginning the way they begin, they have to consider the concept of distinction. And it is a bold step to attempt to base things on the idea of distinction. Because if you begin to think about what you mean by distinction, you realize you don't know what you mean by it. That is to say, you really cannot make a definition of what is a distinction. There may be criteria of distinction, you use them all the time. Um, you know the difference between uh, a lamp and a desk. You know all these things. But if you go in and say, I will become a mathematician for this matter, and I will write down a definition of what is a distinction, you realize that a definition is a certain kind of distinction. Certainly it is. Anything propositional in the form of a definition is some kind of distinction that you make. And so if you were to define distinction in the way that we define anything, you would be defining distinction in terms of distinction and it's circular. And there is an irrevocable circularity in starting to think about distinction. But there is an irrevocable circularity in starting to think about systems also. And so let me continue reading. The next question is then, what is the common basis for a criterion of distinction to isolate system holes? The specification of forms of interaction, which identify a system whole by its stability. That's their answer. And then once you have an answer of that kind, you then realize that you're going to be talking about reference and self-reference in relation to the circularity that's present. And those instances of that circularity that is fundamental come up in different areas in different ways. So as they point out, and I'm continuing to quote them to give us the background, in systems engineering and cybernetics or early cybernetics, it's feedback. In logic and philosophy, it's self-reference and in linguistics. Uh, in philosophy, autonomy. And there is a key word for us in autonomy, as a, for autonomy in philosophy and also biology, the notion of something self-sustaining, recursion in logic, computer science, and mathematics, and self-reflection in psychology, circularity also in psychology, and looping. And and so we have all of these modalities. Uh, and this paper then goes on to produce um, a particular kind of a mathematical formalism that I will come back to after doing a little survey of the other papers that is designed to think about this matter of stability under perturbation for a system and how a system could be organizationally closed and what you would mean by that if you tried to produce a formalism. But, um, but I do want to show you um, a little example before I go to, the, go to another thing, and that is um, the matter of, of closure and self-reference and stability are illustrated very well in topological domains where there are perturbations that would change the shape of something. I can take this, um, you can, I'll call this a rope, although it's a plastic rope. Uh, I could take this rope and I could put a knot in it like this. 
And you may say, well, there is a new form. There is a, uh, a new form of organization of the rope. And indeed, it is a different form of organization from the one that I showed you. But it is also subject to perturbation. And it can, under these circumstances, disappear by sliding off the end of the rope and it's gone. Where did it go? It disappears in the same sense as the circularity of my finger and thumb will disappear when I let it go. The, the stability of this form, the circle, or the stability of the knotted form depends on the locking in or self-reference that allows the stability in the case of the knot. Sorry, you can't see that. The case of the knot, it can become an Ouroboros. It can become a snake that bites its tail. And upon bait it biting its tail, it attains stability. So it attains stability through its self-reference, through its through its self-reference, but it's also, if you look at it another way, through its now organizational closure, because it is now subject to all sorts of perturbations, and it actually changes its form under those perturbations looking like this now, looking like this now. Um, and, um, and the perturbations are movements of that, of that Ouroboros, which doesn't unlink its tail from its mouth. Um, so in the form of, of some examples of this kind, you can see all the themes of this paper and, it's, and all the themes of this um, constellation of thoughts. So for myself, this has always been a touchstone because I like to think about and work with the topology of knots. And when you do that, you see certain themes that are really very, very general of this kind. And you also see some other themes which probably can be expressed in systems terms if we're careful. For example, we are looking at the way a circle can be placed in three-dimensional space when we look at this knot. And up to the perturbations we've allowed it, it remains a knotted circle embedded in three-dimensional space. It will only change from that by uh, breaking it and allowing it to move through itself. And these issues are related to many things. So, uh, for example, they're related to the structure of DNA, but I don't want to digress too far. So, so as you see, the themes in this paper, before it becomes technical, are worth reading and rereading. Um, and I do recommend that when you are looking at these papers, look at them in this multiple level, that they have um, some deep and very uh, cogent philosophical themes, which are well expressed, and worth your while thinking about whether or not you want to go into the mathematical model. And then there is a mathematical model, and you can, which we'll get to uh, their mathematics. Um, but then it's also uh, very beautiful to take some particular kind of mathematical model, like the one with the knots that's easy to understand, and, and go back and forth between that and the philosophical quest. So that's a quick look at that paper. And then uh, I want to jump to a paper that isn't on our list today because it has the very similar theme. And that, uh, so I recommend it to you uh, as part of the papers related to what we're talking about today. And that is the paper a little earlier on autopoiesis uh, by Varela, Monturana, and Uribe. And um, just to show you how close the themes are, look at this quote from that paper and compare it with what we have just said about the closure thesis and, and that every distinguishable system is organizationally closed. Here they say, every unity can be treated either as an unanalyzable whole endowed with constitutive properties which define it as a unity or else as a complex system that is realized as a unity through its components and their mutual relations. If the latter is the case, a complex system is defined as a unity by the relations between its components, which realize the system as a whole, and its properties as a unity are determined by the way this unity is defined and not by particular properties of its components. 
It is these relations which define a complex system as a unity and constitute its organization. Accordingly, the same organization may be realized in different systems with different kinds of components, as long as these components have the properties which realize the required relations. It is obvious that with respect to their organization, such systems are members of the same class, even though with respect to the nature of their components, they may be distinct. And you see it's the same theme, but here in this paper, they are emphasizing how it may come to pass that, a, that a, a system with organizational closure could arise from the interactions of components and perhaps from the interactions of components which know nothing in their own domain of what may arise and what may become or organizationally closed through their interaction. And that paper, um, then, oops, I, I see I didn't uh, copy a, uh, I didn't make a picture of something that I wanted you to see, excuse me. And then they have a mathematical model. There is always this movement be with these people, with this, with this discussion between philosophy and a mathematical model uh, of some sort. And this mathematical model is again, very visualizable. They say, all right, let's consider a, um, a space in which there are molecules. And these, some of these molecules are catalysts. The star is a catalyst. And in the, in the vicinity of the catalyst, the molecules tend to bind to one another. And then there are a couple of rules. But what will happen if molecules tend to bind to one another but could fall apart in the presence of a catalyst? What will happen is that the catalyst will become surrounded by the molecules that are bound together. And a protocell will arise as a result. And these protocells, because of the uh, falling apart and putting back together of, uh, of the dynamics of the substrate, the one with these cells will move around. But for a while, a cell will have a life. It will have uh, its own organizational closure. Um, and it will, um, it will exemplify exactly all these themes of how from the interactions in a substrate, it might arise that a new form will arise and it arises through a distinction being made. And the distinction here is the distinction of the cell boundary. Uh, and of course, another distinction has arisen in that us as observers, we as observers distinguish that cell as well. And, and then that really gives rise to the question of the theme of autonomy. To what extent is this an autonomous form? And to what extent are we bringing it forth through our observation? So all these themes are there in relation to um, a very nice mathematical model that is presented in this paper. And you, you should think of it in parallel to the Varela Gogwin paper I submit. Um, and then, to continue reviewing what papers we're going to be talking about. There is the Calculus for Self-Reference paper, which is the most mathematical of these papers. Well, the Goldwyn paper is mathematical after the philosophy, but this is a very mathematical paper. Um, and it goes back to laws of form. And, um, and I want to um, go off on, on my blackboard and talk about this a bit with you. Um, but I just wanted to point out um, the introduction. Let's read the introduction. An extension of the calculus of indications of, of George Spencer Brown is presented to encompass all occurrences of self-referential situations. In a general sense, perhaps, we'll have to think about that. What does all really apply here? This is done through the introduction of a third state in the form of indication, a state seen to arise autonomously by self-indication. The new extended calculus is then developed. So here we, we have a number of issues which are um, more in the logical domain about what is meant by indication, what would self-indication be, and so on. But 
You see, if you think back to the uh, model of Maturana and Uribe and Varela, then those uh, forms that arose, those cells that arose, are indicating themselves and they're maintaining themselves on the basis of the interactions of the substrate. They're, bio they're biological in essence, and you might think of them in relation to the themes that are presented here. Um, and then what does it look like mathematically? Well, it looks like this. It looks like an extension of laws of form, which we have to talk about a little. And this is a mark which represents a distinction. And it is a distinction. And an autonomous mark is introduced, very nice symbol, uh, following a convention of Spencer Brown about re-entry. And we need to talk about that. And then an algebra is introduced that, uh, that encode certain aspects of this arithmetic of autonomous and and indicative forms so now we have uh talked about everything a little bit and i want to say more by going back to the beginnings of things and i also want to show you another model a kind of model that could be regarded as an inheritor of uh, of the original uh, Maturana Oribe model, you know, Varela Oribe Maturana model. Um, you are looking uh, now at the board of um, cellular automaton, and um, there's a certain rule that I'm using. The trouble with, uh, or the interesting thing about these kind of automata is that they tend to have a very local mathematical rule. In this case, you're born, one of these little dots is born, if it has three neighbors or seven neighbors. You can have up to, you can have many neighbors because you have a little square surrounded by other squares, you see. Um, and you could have seven neighbors. And you survive if you have four, five, six, or seven neighbors. I discovered this rule at a certain point. The question is, how does this behave uh, when the rule is applied? So that is the interaction rule in this case. And this is how it's behaving. Let me run it for you for a little bit. See, it's changing a bit, but it's got an organizational closure. It, um, it, is, um, it is stable under these perturbations up to a point. Let's get a little more room there so you can see it change a little. Um, so it has, uh, it has enough stability under those perturbations that you begin to wonder, well, maybe this is really uh, kind of uh, like a bit of living. What if I perturbed it a little bit? What if I went in here and I changed it a little bit? How will it behave? You see it repairs itself in a certain sense. It can come back under perturbation. Uh, and then, of course, you would like to know, well, as with any uh, quest of this kind, you would like to know what is the range of perturbations that I can uh, give to this organism uh, uh, before it might lose its integrity, its autonomy. But here it is, autonomous enough. Um, maybe I will try um, putting a whole lot of uh, more uh, stuff into the space and see how it behaves. I can do experiments of this kind. I can also, um, of course, um, speed it up a bit. But you see, th this, of course, leads off in, in the mathematical world of, of trying to see how certain things behave under certain kinds of rules uh, into lots of experiments. This particular rule that I told you about, born on three and seven and survive on four, five, six, and seven, has the property of producing um, organizationally closed stable forms uh, uh, that have a certain stability under perturbation. They, have the appearance of, of living in that sense. And 
by investigating them, you can ask philosophical questions and you can ask uh, modeling questions of all sorts. Well, that's perhaps enough about that. But I just wanted to show you that as one more example. So now let's let's go go to a blackboard and and begin this discussion for a little while, just a little while in that way. So, so I want to talk about fixed points, and you'll see why in a moment. Um, so let me give you an example. Uh, suppose that I uh, wrote down the following pattern. a collection of circles, one inside the other, and going on for a very long time, which is what the three dots mean, beyond your ability to distinguish how many circles there are in there. Infinitely many, if you like, or just means very many, all right? Just means keep going, right, forever. Um, so I have this nest of circles. Uh, and this is the form of organization that I'm looking at. But this form of organization, this J, has the property that if I put a circle around J, and I could put a circle around J in the formalism of this uh, program that I'm working with. Well, it's indistinguishable from J itself. Now, of course, I've been very careful to distinguish it from J itself. I put a red circle around it. But, um, but otherwise, um, if you were looking at it, and these circles were all nice and identical, and you couldn't count how many there were because there are so many, and... and um, what I'm saying is that infinity uh, is, for us is the same as too big to distinguish from infinity plus one, right? That's another way of saying what I mean by infinity. So people have a lot of, um, uh, so I'm saying I think of infinitely many circles, but I, I'm perfectly willing to say I think of a very large number of circles beyond my ability to count them. And then if I put one more circle around it, it's still beyond my ability to count them. That's what it is, a collection of circles beyond my ability to count them. And in that sense, that's the J. And so I have that j with a circle around it is equal to j where equal means what does equal mean equal means there is a transformation between these which we're willing to allow right so already in thinking of such a thing uh there are many uh many issues that are projected in here by our previous experience with mathematical ideas and geometric ideas um, and the, the idea here is that you can think of J as you should ask, but this is, this is the metaphor that we're playing with, that J represents 
and autonomous form. That J is, in a certain sense, producing itself out of itself. It is sitting inside itself right there, right? And again, you have to do some experiment with the idea to see whether you are agreeing with this. Is it a good idea for you to think of the J as a representative of a mathematical symbolic representative of autonomy? This is where things start, both in the Gogwin paper and in the Calculus for Self-Reference paper, in taking a formalism of this kind and thinking of that as representing autonomy. So let's, let's play with it a little further. I need another uh, blackboard. So we have to play with these things. Suppose that we take J is equal to circle J, and we understand that when we write equals, we mean that J can be replaced by a circle around it. Hmm? Can be replaced by, yeah? So then, if I, if I said that, then I would have J is equal to, meaning can be replaced by, I'll put an arrow, uh, a circle around J, but that could be replaced by a circle around, then there's J and you can put a circle around that. And then that can be replaced by a circle around, a circle around, a circle around that. And then you could say, oh, and I'll keep on going. And you use the three dots, the ellipsis. But now I never, I never get an infinite form. I just get, I just get more and more nesting. I might get an vast nesting, right? I might, after a while, keep on going, and I would get many, many circles, as many as I care to draw. But down there in the bottom, after a certain number of steps, is the little j, and then it goes on forever. It keeps going on in that fashion. So this little j is a kind of generator of form now. Um, it, Whenever it's present, it, it can emit another circle and create this kind of waveform which is surrounding it. Um, so uh, so j, as, j as autonomous, j as um, some entity which is turning in into itself as an Ouroboros, that J um, becomes a generator of form which uh, can be happening recursively. So this mathematical um, um, pattern, this, this game with the mathematics is capturing certain aspects of what we were, uh, what we were talking about in a general philosophical way. Does it capture the closure thesis? Does it capture the notion that the system whole should be um, organizationally closed? You need to think about that. But the organizational closure that we are talking about here is the fact that it sits inside itself. And on the other hand, there is a dynamics that is associated with the organizational closure and that gives rise to this onion-like form. And you can then easily, uh, <clears throat> if you are playing with mathematical abstractions, take it all the way to infinity and think of it as an infinite form if you want to. You get different results depending on what um, language and what form of this you take. Let me uh, do, a, do a variation of this for a moment. And you may wish to advise me about how much time I should continue here, because I know we want to have a discussion as well. Um, uh, but, Louis, Lou, would five to 10 minutes work? Right, let's use okay. 10 minutes, good. Um, <laughs> I want to go 
back to a sentence, all right? Um, uh, this sentence by Heinz von Forster. Who said, I am the observed relation between myself and observing myself. A nice cybernetic statement. Hmm? Um, uh, I think most people who like to think about systems and cybernetics find this a very interesting statement to contemplate. Uh, and so the statement itself um, uh, has a kind of organizational closure. The statement itself is autonomous. And the statement itself propels you into various recursion. Uh, suppose that we uh, try analyzing this statement um, in the form of diagramming its sentence and, um, and uh, condensing out some of the words. So then um, I'm going to say the following, and this is uh, the, this kind of mathematical motion that is going on in these papers as well. I'm going to make a but this is a particular interpretation. So this is going to mean observing X. Okay. So a mark over it means observing it. Um, and um, X next to Y is going to mean the relation between X and Y. And A equals B means A is B. Yeah, well, what else did you think it meant, right? A is B in whatever sense is means. So, so now what does our sentence become if we translated it into this symbolism? It becomes I am, I am equal to the observed relation, observed relation between I, myself, and observing myself. And we just walked into the other language, into this symbolic language, a very, um, very arid, simple um, language where we use the fewest distinctions we could in order to express it. But this, this, if you translate it, you can just translate it using my dictionary. And it says, I am the observed relation between myself and observing myself. So it's the same, but now it is in the form of a self-referential or autonomous form. And this is exactly that same autonomy only in the case of this autonomy, we have written it with a little extra fillip of, of uh, where it re-enters its own indicational space here and here. So that this autonomy of the Heinz von Forster's eye is certainly a relative of the autonomous form um, that uh, Francisco used. It's just a little more articulated. This one says, I am, my, I am the observation of myself, if you read it this way. Uh, now, these are not fixed interpretations. It's just that if you want to play with what a bit of abstract formalism may mean, you can choose an interpretation and then play with it. And uh, for, for psychological cybernetic uh, reasons, these are good ways to play. 
uh, I, I'm going to say one bit more about the mathematical structures here. Um, two bits more. In laws of form, Spencer Brown. the sign, the mark, um, uh, is equivalent, essentially equivalent to a box or a circle. It makes a distinction. in the plane between inside the box and outside the box. And then there is, um, there is arising from this a certain calculus of forms, which we don't have time to do in a, a short period of time. Uh, but there is a calculus of forms, and this calculus of forms has these rules. I'm using a circle instead of a mark, it's the same. The two circles next to one another is equal to one circle, and that a circle inside of another circle is equivalent to nothing. Um, these are, this is what happens in that calculus. And, and there are very good reasons for understanding why you would take this. Um, the first one is the easiest one to understand, maybe, um, if you made a cartoon of it like this. Here is the large circle. And this large circle happens to be wearing a name tag on which there is a picture of himself. So that we have large circle and his name. And this is equivalent to just large circle. Doesn't need the name tag. You do not have to repeat the occurrence of the same distinction. With the two concentric circles, there's some, one more thing that you need, but I, I don't want to I'm worrying about saying too much, but I wanted to do a little bit. So if you had a distinction, then there are two acts that are related to that distinction, crossing from the inside to the outside or crossing from the outside to the inside. And, and in this, way of thinking, and I realize that I'm going too quickly over this part. One takes this part to be unmarked, and one takes this part to be marked. That's a beautiful simplification that Spencer Brown understood, that he didn't have to have symbols for both sides of his distinction, some distinction here. Uh, and then you see, if you cross, then if you um, if you also use this as the transformation. So the mark can become a transformation or it can be a name. And in this way of thinking, the name and the transformation are regarded as identical to one another. If that sounds like I'm saying something new, it's only because I shifted my language, that the name and the transformation are the same is really the principle of organizational closure. But what you see as an organization, like think of my cellular automaton dynamically changing, 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 what you're finding is that its transformation is its name. What it is, is transforming, but transforming with some stability and becomes its name. And and if you would accept that for a moment, then you can regard this as 
the re as transforming from the unmarked to the marked. So this says cross from the unmarked. And if you cross from the unmarked, where are you? You're marked. So you see the name and the transformation are identical to one another. If you cross from the marked, you're unmarked. That's a very quick picture of what the calculus of indications looks like. Needs to be done, needs to be thought of a, a little more slowly than what we just did, but you have this. Um, and this was in the background of what Francisco is thinking about, because he's thinking that you have this arena, and then later you have this arena where, where self-reference is occurring, and they should be a unity. And he makes them a symbolic unity by starting at the beginning with both this and this at the beginning. So that an autonomous form is placed at the beginning of the structure. And that autonomous form is self-referential and it satisfies that when you cross it, you get it back just like what we've been talking about and some further rules of interaction so that autonomy can be placed at the beginning. That's a place to stop for it's speaking about this, except for one more thing. Who is self-referential? Let's look at it as a box and a re-entering mark. The re-entering mark is self-referential because it sits inside itself. It's explicitly self-referential. The box stands for a distinction. And the distinction that it stands for can be itself. In this sense, it's self-referential. The mark itself is self-referential, just as the dynamical organizational closure of that living organism is self-referential. And just as you are self-referential, so that your self-referential your self-referential nature happens through your being and through just the indication that you make of your being. And it can also be articulated into a propositional kind of self-reference like the re-entering mark that re-enters itself um, and states that it re-enters itself. So that this, um, this work of, of Francisco brings forth the question, how should you think of the beginning? Should you think of the beginning uh, as an autonomy that arose and then things came from there? Should you think of the beginning as an indication of an already given being, how should you think of the beginning? And it doesn't answer the question, but it provides a formalism in which these two ways of thinking about the beginning, an explicit autonomy or the autonomy in relation to the observer of it are together and compatibly together in a kind of mathematics that can be played with. At this point, we are looking at something uh, which can be still can be explored. Um, and that exploration um, in the language of computer scientists and mathematicians is an exploration related to having expanded your logic into multiple valued logic um, and other multiple values or into mathematics itself in relation to the purity of logic. So there are many, many explorations that can come out of this. I haven't mentioned the mathematics of the Gogwin um, Varela paper, but let me uh, take two more seconds.
and show you a gadget which illustrates it. Suppose that I, um, I told you that I had a new operator G and when G meets something like maybe another person, it makes a copy of that and puts it inside a box. The duplicating operator, but a boxing duplicating operator, it uh, delimits it and puts it in a box, but it duplicates. Well, so if, if this meets you, it makes two copies of you and puts you in a box. If it meets me, it does that to me. If it meets three, it puts two threes in a box. If it meets an elephant, it puts two elephants in the box. And what if it meets itself? Now it finds to it signs its interaction with itself sitting inside the box, so that we could take J to be equal to this gremlin interacting with itself, and then J will be self-referential and sitting inside the box. The self-reference arises from J from G's self-interaction, self-reference and self-interaction happening together like that. This is the kind of mathematics, although you might uh, have to work a bit to see that that's what's happening in the Gogwin and Varela paper. Um, this is the kind of mathematics that is being discussed there. They're discussing reflexive domains where every element in the domain is also an action on that domain. This is very familiar to us because we live in reflexive domains. We are, we are symbols for ourselves. We are actors in the domain. And, uh, and the, the second part of the paper where they leave the philosophy and start doing the mathematics is about the construction of reflexive domains. Some of the ideas borrowed from Dana Scott in computer science and others from laws of form. And it's a very interesting thing to explore. Again, it's worth exploring by doing small mathematical examples and then seeing how it fits into the larger context. I'll stop at this point um, and I hope uh, we'll have a good discussion about some of this. Thank you very much, Lou. This was a, a really nice presentation. Uh, we've covered lots of grounds, some very useful examples, I think. Um, I think that in a certain sense, some things have cleared up a little bit. And in another sense, we have become even more confused. At least uh, <laughs> yeah. this is an on, on, ongoing uh, issue for me when I'm faced with, with uh, these part particular topics. So I will start with some questions that um, have been sent to me. Um, the first question uh, is uh, by Andrea Gambarotto, and I'll ask Andrea to pose the question himself, if that's okay. Uh, hello, you hear me? Okay. Well, thanks for the talk. It was uh, very fascinating and very rich, uh, theoretically uh, engaging. And um, so the question I had, uh, it's a question that came to me while I was, um, while you were showing the, the, the model with the cellular automata, but then it kind of stuck with me throughout the rest uh, of the talk and, and, and perhaps concerned also the more mathematical part of the modeling. So these papers were written in, in the mid seventies, more 75, 78. So I was wondering what kind of, impact or legacy they had in the following decades in both mathematical modeling or, I mean, I guess these are both related, but also the cellular automata modeling or more theoretical biology kind of modeling. So I was wondering if you had, I imagine it might require another talk to answer this, but maybe if you have a short version, uh, uh, yeah, I don't have a clear picture in my mind of, of to what extent the 
the formulation that they made in that paper, what the influence of that formula, that formulation is on people who do the AI modeling. Um, so I'll, I have to beg off the question. Um, certainly, uh, Francisco was involved in some conferences that involved AI. And uh, we could look back in those conferences to see how it influenced. The, the idea of autopoiesis has been very influential for systems and cybernetic people because of the, the idea and, and thinking about it in, a, in, in the general sense of how, how, do, how do different kinds of organizations behave. Um, whether it's influenced the technical evolution of AI, it's not obvious to me because AI has been, and, and artificial life, AL and AI, they, they both are looking for technical things that will help them explore. So for example, the Conway type rule that I was showing you was a technical idea, right? Of, of using a neighborhood and a rule about the neighborhood and then people explore that. Um, uh, and, and how, and one, and probably there isn't a lot of, of explicit thought in the literature about how such things relate to the idea of autopoiesis. There's, there's ground for exploration there. Um, if I might just join in, if anybody, for example, if there's a discussion going on, if ever, anybody would like to, uh, chime in, uh, and, uh, add a comment or something like that, just uh, send any type of uh, symbol whatsoever in the chat so that I know that you would like to uh, ask a question or say something or add something. Um, uh, with regards to this particular question though, uh, I was just wondering whether um, people um, such as uh, Evan or or uh, worked with Francisco later on and they, they have kind of seen this development and progression uh, in his ideas uh, might add or comment on this because from from my readings these particular topics kind of slowly fade out uh, in the in the 80s so they're not as prominent uh, uh, conceptually they're still there so the ideas are are, are always present the, the 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 idea of recurrence of of, of self-referential systems but uh, the attempt to formalize them, to use the Spencer Brown system to somehow uh, try to mathematically, uh, to, to, to erect some sort of a mathematically uh, rigorous system to uh, explicate them, to expound them, this slowly fades. And I have no idea as to you know, why this happened, uh, if Francisco eventually decided that this is not something that he would like to pursue. Or, so if anybody has any comments on that or any elaborations on this particular topic, I think that this is a really good opportunity for that. Mm -hmm. I think Evan. Well, well, certainly Francisco didn't continue beyond uh, beyond the very much beyond what he did in um, Foundations of Bio uh, what's it called Principles of Biological Autonomy, um, and around that time he and I were working on some papers together, but. But beyond that time, he wasn't concentrating on this particular line. Um, the, the way in which self-referential structures are considered by logicians and mathematicians continues in its way, but perhaps not, not as philosophical as what we've been talking about. Okay. Uh, Evan and then get through this. So after Evan. Yeah. Um, so this, this is very interesting to me because when I first met Francisco, uh, I was 15 years old. It was when he was doing this work or just maybe a year or two after he had done this work. So I met him, I think first in 1977 or 78. So this, this was around the period um, where this work was, was really uh, quite uh, central in what he was doing. Um, and then, you know, over the next, you know, 10 or so years, when I then started working with him on what eventually became the embodied mind in, you know, in the mid eighties, I, you know, I read principles of biological autonomy and I, you know, I tried to figure out what was going on in Spencer Brown. And I, and I asked Francisco, I said, well, you know, what, 
what are you doing with this work now? So this was around 1986 or 87. And he said, mm -hmm. well, you know, I was really, really uh, immersed in it about 10 years ago. And I felt that I had, that I had kind of played through it for myself, that I had done what I had to do. And, and now I'm, you know, I'm thinking about other things. And this, you know, I mentioned this because it's very characteristic in a way of Francisco was he worked on so many things. And at that point, when I asked him that question, he was really getting drawn into his work on immune network modeling and the immune system. And he was doing his work on color vision, his, his neurophysiology of vision. And then he moved on from that again, you know, uh, in the nineties. So, that's just a little, you know, kind of autobiographical story that I that I did ask Francisco directly about this, and that's what he said. He said, you know, I was really I was really immersed in that. It was really important to me, and and now I'm thinking about other things. Um, and I think that's very characteristic of how he worked in a way. Thank you for this, Evan. Uh, Gertrudis, you wanted to add something to this? Yes, uh, Sebastian, I wanted um, to thank Mr. Kaufman first, because it was such a nice um, presentation. Um, it's in, a, in another life, I've been reading uh, Farilla and Second Order Cybernetics, and I wanted to add on what uh, Sebastian said a moment ago, um, in relation to Second Order Cybernetics, um, that the, there, there is kind of split between the technicity the formal technicity of things and the the way in which second order cybernetics ideas uh, were taken up, mostly in in sociology and human sciences, let's say. And but perhaps there is an intrinsic reason to this, um, namely that uh, in in second order cybernetics, what those people did was to focus on the observer, and Heinz von Furster and Varela and uh, Pask and uh, others came to the, the insight that um, it's just in, in relation to certain systems, it is impossible to take a viewpoint that is external to it. You have to enter the game, so to speak. So the whole issue of self-reference and self-organization uh, is one in which the observer gets internalized. So that's that's one of the things I've been doing, well, seeing afterwards that um, what is necessary is to question the self in the self-reference. And that's where I come to my question of the mark, because um, it, I have to, I, I, perhaps I best explain that my background for asking this question is, um, is psychoanalysis and Lacanian psychoanalysis that has been dealing with these issues. And in relation to which the question is exactly, okay, a mark can have its function, but how will a subjectivation happen through not just an identification of the mark, but the return upon something that becomes through that return a mark, you know? It's not the case that in, in becoming a speaking subject, one just says, oh, there's a mark, I'm going to play with the mark. I mean, it's, it's a matter of at one point of your subjective history, a trait becomes a mark from the moment you return upon it. And from the dynamics itself, something can emerge in relation to inside outside. So um, I was puzzled, um, Mr. Kaufman, by the last things you said about Spencer Brown. It's a long time ago. I, I don't remember exactly, but um, you, you asked the question, who is self-referential? And, 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 and yeah, then we could ask, is it language that is self-referential or perhaps not the subject? Th that was actually my question. So if second order cybernetics has not been taken up, I think it is because um, the epistemology that would be required to deal with self-referentiality is completely revolutionarily different from the epistemologies that prevail. Uh, yes, so let me try talking around what you said a little bit. Uh, on the one hand, uh, in one of the models that I mentioned, the, the one of Uribe and Varela, um, you see uh, 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 a form arising out of some interaction world prior to the arising of that proto-cell. 
And it is so for, for, the, for the distinctions that we have, that the distinctions arise for us. Perhaps we don't know how. Um, we don't have a model about how it arises, but they arise for us. They ar- and, and we see that they arise through the way we are acting and interacting in our worlds. And, and upon their arising, we are able to actually hold them as, as, as distinctions. They become viable systems for us to work with. And we have to think about that. So, so in, in positing an axiomatic kind of na- uh, mathematical system, you, one always has false foundations for it because mm-hmm. one says, I'm assuming this. Um, in geometry, I'm assuming there are something called points and something called lines and some relations between them. And then I can go ahead and investigate my geometry. Um, and in doing this um, laws of form, I'm assuming that there is a, a something which is a distinction. But then it's allowed that I should consider even how I drew it or how it arose. Uh, it's allowed that I think about that. So. Mm-hmm. In fact, it's probably more important that I'm, I'm working with that than that I'm working with a explicit rule, uh, rule generated situation that is the mathematics of it. Okay. I have to go back. Well, I, a person who wants to understand has to go back and forth uh, across those boundaries. Okay. Yeah, and I yeah. think that uh, this has been a perennial, a perennial situation. When Wittgenstein climbing all the way up to the end of his book Tactatus says, whereof we cannot speak, we must remain silent. He's referring to that entire creative domain yeah. that he can't articulate. Yeah, fully agree with you. The one point I, I would like to add is that you, you make an assumption, right? And, and, and the starting point is the capacity to make an assumption. Uh, right, I, I make an assumption <laughs> yeah. of some sort. If, if in discussion I say yeah. to you, I make some principle like Gogwin mm-hmm. and uh, and 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 uh, and Varela did uh, that uh, uh, that states that uh, uh, something about closure. Uh, well, all right, but then that's up for discussion. It's not sure. meant to be a dogma, Mm-mm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but but on the other hand, in mathematics, we we kind of insist that uh, after a certain point, we want to be following out all the consequences of the rules. Hmm. So it becomes a game. It's like, if we've decided to play chess, well, then you're going to be allowed to castle and I'm not going to play chess with you if you say you will, you know, that castling is forbidden and so on. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've chosen a certain set of rules. Um, yeah, yeah. So then some people are, are going to worry, what is the value of having such things? Okay, hey, Lou, I, I would like to uh, hear maybe combine two questions, um, namely, um, and I think that they are not they, they relate nicely to what Gertrude is uh, brought to the fore here. Uh, in her original formulation, Gertrude wrote, "There is the mark and the return upon the mark. Does it involve the same mark? So, mark and return upon the mark. Does it involve? Yeah, the same very mark? good. Yeah, and then." This, I think, relates nicely to the questions that were posed by Natalie and Michelle, namely Natalie said that, um, so that it means that I and myself are the same, which is obvious in the language we use. I equals the first person pronoun, uh, and then myself is the reflexive pronoun. Does it imply reflexivity? So, you know, this question about mark and return upon the mark, how can it be applied to the question about I and myself? So also the, the mark and return upon the mark uh, with regards to myself. And then Michelle added uh, something that is uh, related to this. If someone has tried to implement this self-referential structure to an uh, artificial intelligence system to endow, endow it with something like a sense of the I, so where you would have this uh, self-referentiality that, is, uh, that can be uh, captured on the formal system of a mark and return to the mark, and also on how one understands oneself without necessarily reifying it, uh, and then applying this to, to, the, to the AI. And uh, uh, Lou, if you have something to say on this, and then 
Uh, sure. If anybody uh, else would like to, yeah. Now, let me let me make a, a remark about something that I said uh, in the talk. I, I was using Heinz's sentence where you have I and myself are both in the sentence. I am the observed relation between myself and observing myself. And and upon thinking about that, you um, understand that the myself and the I uh, could perfectly well be separate, different, different thing. That when you if I even if I just said I am the one who says I, the two eyes are very different. There, it's clear that the two eyes are very different because one is simply the said I, and the other is the being I. And um, and so what we do with the I um, is very complex. And on the other hand, there is a symbol for it, I. And that symbol, like a stick, can be handed around. I can talk about myself with I, and, you, I, and as soon as you say it, you're referring to yourself. So there is this simplicity of reference, which is a kind of pivot for something much more complex and beyond the ability to articulate fully. And we keep moving back around that circle again and again, starting with the mark, and then when we come back and understand that we are the ones who drew the mark uh, or we are creating it in our visioning of it, then it becomes a different kind of mark. And, and, um, and one is left with the fact that, the wonderful fact that we can go up to the level of observing the circles that we are going around in. Um, okay, uh, thanks, Lou. Oh, 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 there was one more comment. The yeah, question yeah. was uh, about an AI doing this. Yeah, if there, this uh, I don't maybe... see why an AI couldn't approximate it, but it has to be in. It has to be able to dialogue. Mm -hmm. It has to be better than Surrey, but uh, but something like that. It has to be able to hold a dialogue with you. Yeah, yeah. It has to ask. Yeah, yeah. You have to be able to ask it questions, and you have to be able to ask questions of it. And whether or not it then begins to acquire the subjective eye that you're um, imagining or not may not be so important as the fact that you are now having uh, a good interaction. Hmm. Okay, uh, Evan has a question. Then I have a question from YouTube and Anika after that. So, Evan. Yeah, um, so my question is about paradox. Uh, I think it's in the calculus of self-reference paper that Francisco introduces these ideas in terms of um, self-referential statements that appear paradoxical, that appear that that you know they're they're true and false at the same time, and and the strategy in in this work or the approach in this work from from Spencer Brown and in both of these papers is to um, is is to introduce self-indication or, or autonomy or self-reference at the ground floor, so to speak. In other words, um, you, you take it as basic and then one way that in, in logic you might interpret this is in terms of say a, a many valued logic where you don't just have true and false, but you have say time as one interpretation of, of um, this kind of self-indication. So my question is, um, I, I would like to hear from you, you know, as a logician and mathematician, how you think about this in relationship to something which I think has been very influential in AI, which is paraconsistent logics, which seems to me to take a different kind of approach because it's an approach where you're allowed to assert contradictory statements, but you have various ways, at least as I understand it, I'm not a logician or mathematician, but I understand you have ways of preventing um, explosion where you can derive any proposition from the contradiction. And that would seem to me just intuitively to be a different kind of, of approach where there's a preservation of an object language, meta language distinction, and you don't introduce self-reference as, as something basic. And so I'm, I'm, I just would like to hear from you your thoughts about this, um, these, these, what seemed to me from the outside anyway, as two different kinds of conceptual strategies for, for dealing with paradox. Yeah, right. Um, so first of all, um, it, it, if, you, if you play the game of the logic with, the, with allowing for not and so on, uh, the way you usually do, then 
And, and then keeping a self-referential mark, which is its own negation, appears to lead to a contradiction. Um, and then, um, and then you could build uh, something like Varela's calculus for self-reference with different rules from the usual logical rules to accommodate the existence of this autonomous form, which is paradoxical in the usual domain. Um, and th this, is the, this is a route very similar to using multiple valued logics, changing your logic in order to fit the situation. Uh, uh, let me give you another way to think about this by doing an example. Uh, I'll take the screen for a moment. Um, I think I'll take the screen there. Okay. So so let, let me try to explain what the paradox is in these terms. The paradox is the paradox of the liar. This statement is false. Liar paradox. And we all know that this is somehow inconsistent, right? Because if it's false, uh, uh, if it were false, then um, it would have to be true. And if it were true, it would have to be false. And, and we could write it in, in logical syntax as the liar says that it is the same as not the liar, right? The liar in, indicates that its truth value is the opposite of its truth value. So in this way, it looks like our friend Jay, the re-entering mark. Well, it looks just like the re-entering mark, um, if you think of this as being not. Now, I said it was observed. Uh, so there are many interpretations, but allow it to be not, all right? And then this looks like the paradox. And, and then... And then I want to give you a little formalism. So when I write this, you must think I'm a strange bird that I give you completely different looking interpretations, but, um, but we'll take this one. Uh, this is the usual one, actually. So this is going to mean A or B, okay? A or B one or the other, next to it. And so if I had false next to true, then that would be true because one of them is true. Mm -hmm. But if I had false next to false, that would be false. And if I had true next to true, that would be true. Okay? So that's a usual way of doing logic symbolically. And we could put this guy and next to his negation. And, and then this would be the liar put or the negation of the liar, right? The liar or the negation of the liar. Now, what do you think this should be? If I said um, it's raining, or not raining in the ordinary logical world. Is this true or false? Oh, it's true. It's true. It's either raining or it's not raining. One or the other, right? That's our usual way of speaking. So, um, so if you said to me, um, are, are you going um, to take the car today? My wife says to me, are you going to take the car today? And I, and I said to her, well, either I will take the car or I won't. Um, I'm perfectly within my limits. I've told her the truth, but I haven't given her any information and she's probably going to get annoyed with me. But it is a logical fact that if I say P or not P, then this is true. Okay. It should be true. So if 
if he if somebody says J or not J, then this should be the same as now. We can do it formally. J is equal to not J. So I can just put in for J, right? I'm using this. So I just put in that, and then two J's together is just repeating it. So that's J, right? So I, I didn't get true. I got whatever the value of J is. Well, maybe J is true, but the problem is that J is also false. So what I'm getting is that this should, this seems to be both true and false because J is both true and false, right? So here's J, it's both true and false. And maybe that is bad, but it seems like it could be self-contained, just J is autonomously true and false. Depends on when you look at J, whether it's gonna be true or false. But this fellow here, he's J, and we thought that he would always be true, but he isn't always true. He seems to be both true and false, and that's a paradox. So that's the paradox. It has to do with the relation of J and J cross turning out to just be J. How are you going to uh, eliminate this paradox? Well, one way to eliminate this paradox is to say, I shall not have this rule. The rule would be P, P cross uh, equals a mark if you were writing it in the, this is the usual rule, but you don't need to worry about that. It's just that it says it's true. And, and we would have a rule like that in the usual work world. But in this world, we have to eliminate the rule. So this is one thing you could do. You could let go of what's called the law of the excluded middle. Well, that's one way to go. That's that's the that's the new logic way to go, and and many people feel like that's a good solution because they never liked the law of the excluded middle. If I say to you, either it's raining or it's not raining, you might say to me, "Well, actually, it might be snowing. Maybe it's something else." You're you're ignoring all the possibilities. There's always something else other than this this the declaration that it's one way or the other. So. So this is the this is one way to go, and that's not your paraconsistent logic way. It's the usual way. So I spent a lot of time talking about the usual way, but now I don't know that what I'm about to tell you is the same as paraconsistent logic, but it's a kind of analogous to it. So we call this flag resolution after Jim Flagg, who invented it. I can't spell resolution. Um, and that is that with, with a paradoxical element like this, you must change all or none of the appearances of J. This maintains the relationship of J and J cross. You'll see what I mean. If I have together J and J cross, and if at a given time J is true, and then J cross at that time will be false, and this will be true, just like it was, right? The opposite. That'll be fine. but. If I substituted J cross for J, then it becomes paradoxical. So what you are allowed, this is allowed. I'm allowed to change them both. Oh, sorry. Let me make it clear what I'm doing. I'm going to change the first J for a J cross and the second J for a J cross 
but that was happening inside of a month. I changed J to J cross, but I got to do it to all of them. The relationship then remains the same, but they've all been changed. So J is still equal to J cross, but when you change it, you have to change them all. And then this just doesn't have any problem at all. This just turns into J cross and this is double negation. And it doesn't matter in what order you write them. And it just came back to itself um, and didn't, turn into a paradox at all. So this is how it's possible for the paradox to coexist with other things. By having certain relational properties, the paradox has a certain relational property, but, um, but it isn't giving you a contradiction anymore. So this may be uh, uh, viewed as a, a kind of fragment of something like pure consistent logic where you were, you're allowed to have paradoxical entities. Another example would be complementarity of Niels Bohr kind of, of complementarity where Bohr said, the opposite of a great truth is another great truth. And we can think of examples of this, but when you do that, you change your context when you go to the opposite. You don't stay in the same context and have a contradiction. You shift the entire context through the complementarity when you do that. And so a particle can be a wave, but when a particle is a particle, it's, not, it's in a different context than when it's a wave. Does that, does that begin to speak to your question? It's a very interesting, uh, actually, way of presenting it. Uh, uh, the notion about the different contextualities and then how this might solve the seeming polar opposite, so to speak. <clears throat> I have one question that I would like to ask. It's uh, from a viewer uh, on YouTube, uh, Jonathan Hipner. Um, the, que the question goes as follows. How does change come into this infinite circle of repetition, the J circle? So the, this is the example of the, the J and then circle around J and we have the infinity mm -hmm. circles. So uh, Jonathan, Jonathan says for Hegel, this would be what he calls bad infinity, infinity represented as non-creative, non-evolving formula. In life, even simple bacteria, in addition to this repetition, you can observe addition of structures. So if we maybe disregard the specific context, so the, uh, I, I don't think it's crucial, uh, you know, uh, if, if one understands Hegel in great depth or not. But the point is, uh, if I understand the question correctly, that it seems to be so that there is a danger that this type of approach might somehow uh lead into uh a, a very repetitive uh patterning or or something that is somehow um non-creative non-evolving uh I, I i think that this is what jonathan is asking so how does change come into this infinite circle because it seems to just repeat the same patterns and nothing basically new emerges there is no uh, no addition of structures, as Jonathan puts it. Uh, so there, there is an oscillating structure, but I think Jonathan is aware of that, right? That if we had J is equal to J cross, and we, we played it out in time, uh, then J would be oscillating between the value of true and false, or circle and no circle, circle and no circle. So... Uh, so there is a, a pattern that comes out. And this pattern in this case is very simple. It's a simple oscillating pattern. So on the one hand, it is a static self-reference. And on the other hand, it is an oscillating pattern. But um, if I had a more complex self-referential rule, let me give you an example. Um, then I will get very interesting results from it. Uh, actually, let me do an example. Excuse me. Oh, uh, I think, I think that's, 
oh, I see what happened. Yeah, there. Just to make an example of a rule that works nicely. Um, let's see here. Uh, whether whether I'm going to be able to do this is another question because of the computer and trying to do too many things with this computer at once. Right, that's not going to work. Sorry. Um, I'll just use my pad. It's better anyway. Um, if the rule is more complicated, suppose the rule is that if you have a, a bit of line, and you're familiar with this rule, you are allowed to uh, cut a middle third out of it and replace it by the other two sides of the triangle. And then uh, you do this again and again. So at the level of um, at the level of um, of the recursion, the recursion is uh, something like this. And utterly static, right? Um, that's the, that's the, the statement of the infinite form. Um, put another way, it looks like this, that it re-enters its own indicational space here and here here and here, right? Um, and you can follow that slavishly. This is another uh, another relative of, uh, of, of this, right? It's a relative of that. Um, and, and it has a more complex geometric rule. And we know that it leads to some really very beautiful and interesting structure, the, the Koch curve with uh, all its fractal properties and so on. But then, it does lead to having having done that. It leads within the geometry context um, to some very interesting questions, like what is the length behaving as uh, as it gets longer and longer? How do you talk about its length, and how and how does all that work? And that that leads into that whole subject of fractals and their structure. So, um, and 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 the and then and then once one starts to think about about space possibly filled with with oscillating always operating structures of that kind one one begins to think of another kind of physics uh or you may think of it in terms of psychology there are lots of different interpretations so that out of a very simple recursion in a context comes really a great deal uh as we know so that may be a partial answer to the question of is there going to be creativity in a simple recursion? And the answer seems to be, remarkably, yes. And, um, and the simplest one that I can think of for mathematics is this recursion, add one, right? N goes to N plus one. And the, the infinite side of that is infinity goes to infinity plus one, right? Or infinity is equivalent to infinity plus one. But as a generator, that means that you start with infinity and then you get infinity plus one and then you get infinity plus one plus one and so on. And you are generating all the numbers, right? And then all the numbers have all the properties that they have and we have this rich domain. So that um, all I'm saying is something that we all know that if you design a simple set of rules, that doesn't mean that the dynamics of what you design is simple or uncreative. In fact, it has, it has with, within the purvey of your own continued circling back through it, um, of possibilities for enormous articulation of creativity. Oh, I would add something here, um, and this is, my my own comment or question uh it would seem that uh, time here plays a crucial role but is somehow presupposed as some sort of a 
self-explanatory or, or like transparent or uh, completely clear phenomenon or or something. Uh, so we we have this recursion, and after certain repetitions are made, then one might get these very complex structures. But this temporality seems to play the crucial role. Yet this temporality is simply presupposed, but it's never really explicated or somehow being um, understood in any way. So is this something that might be a problem for any attempts that try to formalize a certain phenomenon? Because in a certain way, you have to presuppose temporality to get the whole process going and understand it, but you cannot really incorporate it into the story itself formally, or can you? Well, we formally incorporate the ability to take a step by a rule, right? So, but then what, what can happen in there is quite unknown to us. Think of a game, say chess, right? Set of mm -hmm. rules and, and the further rule that at every juncture in the game, either black or white must move or else the game is over, right? And if we knew what was going to happen from the beginning, we would have solved it. And the problem for the person playing the game is how do I know what is the best move in this board for me right now? And, and, I, and I can only calculate a little. How do you know? Um, so on the one hand, you know what a step is, but if you were to really know time, you would know it all the way to the end of that universe. And you don't. Um, that's so, the in, so in these games or mathematical situations, we see that even though we have everything tacked down, the rules are all there, we still know very little. And this is true in, in ordinary infinite mathematics as well. There are simple recursions involving ordinary whole numbers that seem to have a certain property, but nobody knows how, how to get at the proof of that. Uh, as soon as we go into iterating step upon step upon step you are indeed you have indeed walked into the mysteries of time and those mysteries of time seem nevertheless well specified and the true mysteries of time in a world where not everything is formalized are are perhaps something that we're going to discover sooner or later okay Thank you. Maybe one or more, two more questions, and then we, we can wrap this up. Um, um, Anika, you posed the question if you would like to read it, or at least a certain segment of it. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'd also like to say thank you again to uh, you, Lou. Um, I learned a lot by the way you place this into larger context, and also by the way that you are using the language, so it's very helpful. Yes, my question uh, popped up when you said um, that cells maintain themselves in relation to the substrate. And so when you said this, I wondered where is organizational closure in this instance? Because I, I felt like there were two uh, closed systems, like a cell and then some implicit larger whole that includes the substrate or else this interaction with the substrate of the cell couldn't be stabilizing for the cell. And I think maybe this is also from the discussions that already happened, I would place myself in, on the spectrum of people who are interested in how the distinctions come up in the first place. So I guess this is sort of the background in which I ask this uh, question. Maybe this is enough from my side. <laughs> Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the, of course the organizational closure of the, you're speaking of the proto cells in that model, yeah? Yeah. Yes. Uh, and and the the organizational closure is what you have perceived there, right? Um, and 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 so one question is how how complex a structure do we need in order to perceive the the distinction that was happening there? We easily perceive it. We're used to looking at a plane and we see the pattern in the plane. We see that the 
uh, these these entities are surrounding the catalyst and and that they remain surrounding the catalyst or or if i were to um tie a knot in the rope uh then you perceive the knot in the rope and you can see it sliding along the rope uh and um and so you can find it um if you if if we were not good enough at finding it then in our world uh, the protocells really wouldn't be there but we were able to find them and and this goes on all the time with us we we didn't know that there were rings around saturn at first and even when we first saw them they didn't look like rings and then eventually it became clear they were rings and we we keep coming into some stability of a distinction and that stability of a distinction that we come into um is 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 a indicator of our interaction uh as much as whatever it was that was seen so uh if you're asking can i build a model of how a distinction arises for an observer i think it's a great question but i don't know how to build a model in the sense of building a computer that could do it well except that we do have computers that do it within limited limited um, arenas of course so the I'm, I'm not sure I'm answering the question, but I'll better stop talking. Um, um, before I go to the last question, um, I would just like to add that uh, precisely this question of how a distinction is made, how the, how, how the act of indication happens is a very interesting question. And I think that it's, um, one of the reasons why uh, this book by Spencer Brown is so fascinating because it seems to connect a certain way of formalizing things, world, what have you, with also uh, certain more phenomenological approaches to the, to, to the world where this precisely the distinction is somehow also a crucial segment, crucial element in the dynamics of the lived experience. So how, how the world and myself somehow co-constitute one another and how this comes about and so on and so forth. Not something we have to pursue, but definitely something we can maybe return to in our later sessions. Now, the last question was posed by Victoria and I find it uh, um, a question that, that will end our first meeting on a very unique and somewhat different note uh so i find it i think that for this particular reason it is very appropriate uh so victoria go ahead thank you so again thank you louis for your presentation so what i'm interested in is basically in your take on certain meditative or mystical experiences during which a meditator would come into or experience a sense of oneness or union with the world. So in a sense where the meditator would dissolve into the world so that the senses of boundaries loosen. So the sense of foreground as a self and the world as background would in this case not be separate anymore and thus the meditator could be said to be beyond duality. Um, and I am basically interested in how we can understand this type of beingness or this type of experience of the organism in the line of work put forward by Spencer Brown, Brown and then Varela's extension of that work. And I am particularly interested in your take on this from the perspective or focusing on the fundamental idea of distinction? Thank you. It's a great question. I think that an answer to exploring that uh, in this context is that you can look at distinctions in your own experience and see the extent to which they are solid or not. So um, meditation teachers, um, if you think about what they ask you to do, 
uh, generally are pointing you in that kind of direction, but perhaps not in the language of laws of form or distinctions. For example, in a shamatha practice, the, the person says, uh, well, watch, sit quietly, and if the thought arises, observe it, but let it go. And, and so, so then the distinction you normally make of grabbing the thought and, and, and making it part of you is, is being disturbed and, and you, you keep uh, going through a process where you are no longer identified with your thoughts eventually, but, but it keeps on happening, of course. Um, or um, someone like Eckhart Tolle will give that instruction and say, waiting for the next thought. And that's a thought, but that waiting for the next thought thought is a thought at another level than the thoughts that are naturally arising. It's more like just sitting. So, so you're, you're, you're examining the distinction that is occurring. I give another example. Um, oh, I forgot his name. The, the man who has no head. Um, there's a meditation teacher who points out to you that you have no perceptual head. It's something you've imagined. You see it in the mirror, but uh, when you are simply sitting quietly looking out at the world, there is no head. And then this is rather startling and, exper and can be played with experientially because after all, you can look at the boundaries of how much of what you think of as your head is a head and you can play in your mind with, there is no head. I have only the void of my experience of the head. And, and if you play with those distinctions that way, you begin to loosen the sense of, of grasping onto uh, um, entities as though they were real when they are simply indicators of state. Mm -hmm. Does that help? That's a, I think that's a very interesting idea. Maybe uh, also, what, what you said could be related to that uh, famous line from the uh, Mahayana Buddhist tradition where um, form is emptiness and emptiness is form. So mm -hmm. uh, you cannot but make distinctions, but in a certain sense, these distinctions are empty. That is to say, fluid and dynamic and being able to grasp this and live this through in a certain sense where you know that a human being is a being of forms, of structures, of distinctions, but not being caught up in that is something that could be related to what, what Victoria said. It is, a, it is the possibility of having this non-duality, but as soon as you try to kind of indicate it or speak about it or in any way try to do something with it or even say what I've just said, there is a distinction and indication and uh, the danger that people might grasp onto this as something that is solid, substantial, and uh, somehow self-given. Just a thought, maybe. <laughs> Remember also that in, in our simple illustrations, we draw a circle in the plane. The plane is undoubtedly whole without having the circle drawn in it. But, but having drawn the circle, we have an inside and an outside, but, but it is our creation. And if we look again, we see, oh, it's the whole plane, and, and we happen to have drawn something there. Okay, I think uh, this would be a nice place to stop. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you for all the questions. Uh, I'm really, really happy that we've started with this series. Uh, uh, and thank you so much, Lou, for... Um, uh, for your presentation and all the answers. Um, I'm really looking forward to uh, pursuing some of these topics in our next discussion, not next discussions. Uh, okay, just before, be, before we uh, say goodbye, before, our bid, we, before we bid our leave, um, I would just like to say that next time um, we will be talking about what in my uh, personal view is one of Francisco's best papers still. So not one, not two, an old paper from 1976. And Evan Thompson, 
uh, will be presenting it. I'm sure that he'll make a great job of that. So I'm really, really looking forward to that, uh, at that as well. Anyway, thank you again for being here. Thank you for all the comments and questions. Uh, and I'll be seeing you in, what is it? On 7th of April, 7th of April in three weeks. Okay. Thank you. Oh, and bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.